So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Remote Working and Engaging Your Employees session. Uh, my name is Robin Martin. I'm an AVP at Log Me In, and delighted and excited to welcome you to this session. Three quick things of note before we get into the, the meat of it. Um, one quick uh, update as far as what Log Me In do. We do provide remote support solutions and a quick advert for something exciting happening at 6 p.m. this evening where we will be launching some groundbreaking technology, spookily enough, at six o'clock this evening. So please, please, please attend that. I'm sure you will be uh, very compelled by the content. The third and final thing to mention just before I get going is that there will be a Q&A session at the end of this where Dave and I will be taking uh, questions and please submit them as we go along in the chat capability that you can see. So let's get going. Um, I started my career at uh, IBM, which I'm happy to confess, uh, in HR, which sometimes for someone in uh, the role I'm in is uh, unusual, uh, but I feel I'm pretty fortunate to have that uh, background as it's given me uh, a unique insight, potentially in terms of uh, helping my current role in how looking at new ways of working for employees everywhere. The focus on employee health and well-being has never been more important than it is today. So a couple of um, statements for you to consider and to kind of reflect on. Seven weeks ago, if you'd have said some of these things, what do you think the uh, response would have been? Uh, our entire workforce is going to work remotely. Today doesn't mean anything, does it? This is kind of pretty standard. Do we really need that office? Pretty exciting one. Does this shirt go with my shorts? Perhaps not the kind of average question that you would, uh, you would ask. And my daughter cut my hair. Uh, maybe not such a biggie, but uh, true nevertheless. Joking aside, like all of you, I'm joining you from home where I've been socially distancing and working remotely for 60 days. Not that I am counting. What we're seeing today is not a remote exper experiment, I should say. It is an acceleration of a shift that has been 20 years in the making. The shift to a flexible workplace was well underway before this crisis, but COVID-19 has undoubtedly forced our hand and changed working patterns and the adoption rate of technology forever as companies all over the world are forced to embrace remote working. Many companies and their people are already starting to talk about the benefits of this change. Why didn't we do this sooner? I really miss the 7.35 to Waterloo. I mean, it's a biggie. I really, it's a really exciting thing. I really miss. I can spend more time with my dog or my family. Uh, you can choose. And many are even starting to see a positive impact on their businesses and customers, including increases in customer NPS and handling times, because as we know, happy employees make for happy customers. So here at Log Me In, we feel we have a unique perspective in two ways. We know what it takes to embrace the technology that enables remote working and working from anywhere. And we are in a great position globally to offer the very best solutions companies that need it to not only keep their shop sign saying we're open, but more importantly, to help them prosper in a very different new business world that's emerging. Enough from me. My uh, main task today was uh, to introduce Mr. Copeland, who you can see to my left or right, depending on which way you are, you are looking at it. Uh, Dave is uh, currently CEO, Chief Envisaging Officer of the Envisions Limited. He is uh, an author, written a number of books, the rise of the humans, making things happen, and business reimagined. But don't worry, this is not a book launch. He's not releasing anything as, as far as we've been, uh, we've been told.
But over the past 25 years, he's provided strategic advice and guidance around the impact of technology on a modern society. But perhaps his uh, biggest claim to fame is he won the Crystal Maze, uh, which for those of you who are not familiar, is a UK game show. And uh, he may well be revealing the uh, crystal itself. Who knows? Anyway, Dave, over to you. So hi there and welcome. And thank you so much for having me uh, to this fantastic event. It's a great privilege to, to be a part of it. Let me skip straight to uh, my background and why I think I've got something to tell you. Um, I have uh, spent the last three decades working in the world of IT. I've worked with or for the world's largest technology companies. I started my career with Apple. I spent 12 years at Microsoft. And now I run my own company, helping people understand the future potential of technology. So basically, I've spent 30 years inside the second smallest rooms inside most organizations. You know these rooms. These are the rooms with no natural daylight, just the whirring of the fans and the blinking of the LEDs to keep you company. Uh, I've gone to the extremes of personal grooming uh, to grow a little goatee beard and a rather fine uh, ponytail. Uh, and guess what? I also quite like Star Trek. Yeah, I know that's hard to believe. This is actually my eighth birthday party. It's my mum and my auntie Mabel back there. Um, uh, stick with me, I'll make it relevant. The point about Star Trek is that when I was a kid, Star Trek taught me that technology was supposed to be a force for good in our lives. It's this thing that enables human beings to rise up and achieve even more than they could do on their own. This is the point for me of technology. It's why technology should exist to extend human reach. Uh, but my problem, my problem is those 30 years in IT because I look around at how we all use technology today and I don't see that great sort of opportunity. I actually see a prison. I see something that constrains how we work, controls to an extent how we think. And quite frankly, I refuse to uh, let that be the sort of the future that we walk into. So a few years ago, I started to think, well, what can I do about this? How can I address this challenge? Excuse me. So I started to write books. Uh, my first book was called Business Reimagined. And this is really the story I want to focus on today. It's about how the way we work today, even today in 2020, in the weird situation that we're in, it doesn't work. Um, and I followed that up with another book, which is really about our relationship with technology and how that holds, uh, holds us back. So I want to bring these two stories together and bring them against the context of the world that we live in today to really show you how we can engage employees to use technology to do amazing things. Now, before we go any further, there are two things that you need to know about my books. Number one, I'm a relatively cheap date. So if you're interested in them, you can get them for free off Amazon. If you have a Kindle, you can just download them from there. Or if you don't have a Kindle, tweet me and I'll send you a download code. The second thing, and I'm always a bit embarrassed to have to confess this in public, but um, look, you just need to know that there was a point in my past life where I was a bit down on my luck um, and I ended up doing some things for money, don't tell anybody, that I'm not really proud of. Um, Oh, look, I was just, I was a management consultant, all right? Don't, don't, don't judge me. Uh, and the thing is, the thing about being a management consultant is you will find no answers in my books because uh, I was a good consultant. But what you will find, and you'll find again in the next 25 minutes, is a series of provocations. My job is to challenge the way that you think about your relationship with technology, is to challenge the way you think about how technology can empower you in everything that you do. And my story starts here. It starts with employee engagement. And employee, employee engagement is abysmal around the world. My opening sort of chapter to the, to the first book talks about how in the US, 71% of US employees are disengaged at work. The numbers are very similar in the UK. And even though the book was written about six years ago, the numbers have stayed pretty consistent. So think about that. More than two thirds of the workforce is disengage the work now okay a small portion of them are like actively disengaged but for most part the majority of people are just not that bothered about work and this is terrible because it has a massive impact not just on how much work gets done the quality of work but also the quality of life and so I wanted to understand what is this thing about employee engagement and how is our relationship with work related to that and what I found is that there is this really sort of a tricky thread about productivity in the way that we think about work. And actually, it turns out that the majority of our problem comes from this thing called productivity, which sounds counterintuitive. But if you think about it, if you start to boil it down, you think about productivity, it's not so much productivity per se, but it is how we choose to define productivity. And we choose to define productivity based on this sort of cold economic equation based on uh, coming out of the Industrial Revolution, really, which is output divided by input. It is a focus is a process of a, a, a sort of way of thinking about productivity that fixates us on the process of work. 
Now think about how we work. And most organizations, we felt that the most efficient way for us to work would be to break down our organization into a series of standardized interlinked processes that basically ensures that we can make more products more quickly, more cheaply. But over time, what's happened, and again, because of our fixation on this definition of productivity, we've become stuck focused on the process of work rather than the outcome of work. Think about it. Let's use a silly example. Let's say I work at an automotive manufacturing plant and I'm there on the production line and I'm, and I'm making widgets, right? And, and whether this is the right gesture for making widgets, I don't know. I've never, I've never made a widget, but I'm guessing it would be something like this. The thing is, this is my part of the process of the whole organization, of the whole thing that goes to make the end product. But I am being paid only on my contribution of making widgets. And so frankly, as long as I'm making the best damn widgets this company's ever seen, it doesn't matter whether the car's any good or not. It's, it's, so I'm disconnected from the outcome of work. The second problem with this approach to productivity is that by creating an organization based on a series of standardized interlinked processes, you end up with this rigid sclerotic infrastructure that resists change. So when you want to change your organization, when the market changes, when there's a recession or a pandemic, you can't because the only way that you can actually adjust as an organization is you have to completely break the organization to be able to reassemble it. And this pro sort of focus on process is the thing that's really, really difficult for us to try and transform if we want to move forward, if we want to change what we do. And then we start looking at these processes that we've inherited. And actually, you realize that many of these processes were based on old ways of working. Now, I grew up in the UK, a place very near sort of the industrial heartland of the UK. It was a place where 200 years ago, if you were going to work, you were going to work in probably one of these places. These are Arkwright's dark satanic mills. And, you know, that was fair enough. A couple of hundred years ago, if you wanted to work, then you had to be near a mill. You had to be near the place of employment. But the challenge is we're now 200 years later and we not have, don't have to be near mills, but still we fixate around the process and the place of work. And if you bring these two worlds together, what you soon start to realize is both the way we think about work, but also the processes that we perform at work are essentially 19th century processes. We still continue to work like we're Victorians today, even though we have this amazing 21st century technology. If we take that to the way that we define work, you know, what is work? Many of us, even now, still think of work as a destination. I'm going to work. And all right, a few weeks ago, going to work might have meant going to the office. Today, going to work means I'm going to the front room or to the spare room or wherever it may be. But it's still this focus of work as a destination when actually work is an activity. It's not a place you go. It's something you do. And when you think about work in that context, that's when the magic can start to happen because we can start to disconnect this sort of sense of location and then start to think about the activity of work. Now, for years, I've been talking to people about the opportunity for flexible working. And, you know, even now we still have this concept of flexible working where it's a kind of a binary thing, you know, so I'm at work or I'm, or I'm not at work. And, and the reality is that that's not how we live our lives. It isn't binary. It's not at work, not at work. We feather those two worlds. And we did it even before the situation that we're in now. If you remember, you know, all of us would be in this situation. How many times would you be at work, maybe sat at your desk and, and you're, you know, shopping on Amazon? or chatting with your friends on Facebook and equally how many times have you found yourself in the grocery store on the weekend and as you're bimbling around you have a quick look at your work email just to see what's going on this is flexible working flexible working is about location but it's also about time and one of the things we've got to unpack in this new world is is really a new definition of what flexible working truly means and we're going to come right back to that but my challenge to you is that unless we fundamentally change our approach to productivity, unless we fundamentally change our concept of the world of work, this whole glib cliche about working smarter is inaccessible. It's completely unobtainable. If we continue with the same relationship that we have with technology, if we continue with the same approach that we have to world's work, the only choice we will have left is simply to work harder. Now, I don't know about you, but I've reached a point in my career where the concept of me continuing to work hard, that's not what I signed up for. I'd like a different future and I'd love for you to join me in that future. 
And, and the sort of the irony for me is, you know, for years I have been screaming at you all, at your organisations. I've been asking you to think about flexible working, about how technology can enable us to work in a different way. This was a piece of work I did based on the book. Uh, it's a lovely video for the RSA, but it really starts to unpack this challenge about changing the way we work. And I've been begging for you. You should make it easy for people to work from home. You should actually mandate that people are able to work from home or from other locations. And look, we're now in a situation where that is the norm what a wonderful time this would be but our challenge our challenge is how do we sustain that now here's part of the deal right because our approach to the way that we think of the office has to change and you know if you think about the concept of the office this is some clip art brilliantly from the 50s right so this is the office of the 50s and so here we have an employee we have a communication device look at that we have a, a, a bit of technology um all good right Let's fast forward to 2020. All right, and let's fast forward to the beginning of 2020 because we'll get to where we are today a bit later on. And, and actually, although I would argue that probably the lady in this picture has probably got a better job and better pay uh, and hopefully a bit more equality uh, than this, this lady, the reality is, look at here, I've still got a communication device. I've still got a computer, a typewriter of sorts, and I'm still sat at a desk. It's not changed. In all this time, our concept of what the office could be, how we work hasn't changed. Now, okay, maybe the world has changed and maybe the office of 2020, certainly of April 2020, is a bit more like this. And I love stock art, right? How many of this, I tell you what, every single day of my lockdown life looks exactly like this. I am well presented. I am smiling. I'm high-fiving the people. No, no. The reality of my day and is much more like this. this meditation is great for bringing about a sense of relaxation, well-being, and calm. So starting just quickly by breathing in. And breathing out. And it's really challenging, I know, with children home from school and working from home, but just trying to just keep all of those distractions out of the way. Now, how many of you have had that experience over the last few weeks? And actually, do you know what? I think it's wonderful. Um, I'm sure many of you would have been like this. Um, in, in the years running up to the situation that we're in now, if ever you were working from home, you would do that thing where you're like, I'm just I'm going to be on a call for work. Okay, can you just not, not disturb me? And, you know, can you stop the dogs from barking? And I'm going to unplug the phone because I have to present this really formal approach to how we work. And, and I get that, right? But the reality is we're all human beings. Some of us have kids or dogs or, you know, other lives. It shouldn't stop us from being able to work from home. And one of the greatest lessons I hope the last few weeks has been able to teach us about the culture of working away from the office is that this is okay we're all human and if we can move forward then people start to feel a bit more relaxed about it a bit more comfortable with the approach and we can actually sustain it now what support supports and sustains this opportunity to work in different ways of course is our personal relationship with technology because over the last few years that has dramatically changed and nowhere is that more apparent in how we collaborate if you think about how we collaborate in our personal lives it almost is the inverse to how we collaborate in our professional lives because in our personal lives our default is to share look at the things that i was doing on the weekend look at my kids my dog my motorbike whatever it might be wow look at that and then we're at work it's like well actually i'm not going to i'm going to give you i'm going to show you that bit of information the ability for us to change our approach to collaboration based on our personal experience offers us huge potential and it offers us huge potential in changing the culture of how we think about how we work and the engagement of people and we need to harness that we need to bring that because when we get it right we know how powerful that is and it's not just in terms of what it means to communities or society it's what it means to your organization if you can let knowledge flow if you can enable people to collaborate freely using the tools that they have regardless of the location all the time that they're working the amazing power that you unleash inside your organization so I want to start to bring this all together I want to start to give you some things that you can do in your organization some ways that you can think about this in terms of approaching how you engage your employees in a world where they aren't necessarily working in the office in the physical container of work every day of the week
So let's look at the first thing. The first thing is if we really care about the two most important types of people are our customers and our employees, right? And if we want to deliver transformational experiences to them, there's a really simple way of thinking about it. The only way that we can deliver transformational experiences to our customers in particular is, is that if we empower our employees to be transformational, we need to allow them, empower them to work in ways that are different, are transformational, that we allow them to ask questions, to challenge, to come up with new ideas to create that culture of you are empowered to help us drive this business forward and if you're lucky enough to have established that culture then actually you realize you only will be successful if you enable those employees with the tools that enable them to work in transformational ways and i'm really sorry to tell you that you're not going to be transformational over email it's just not going to not even as an attachment right it's never going to happen these are different tools and that's tools like slack or teams or whatever it may be things that enable people to use that natural sort of way of collaborating that they use in their personal lives to unleash the knowledge that lies hidden dormant inside your organization if you can get that culture right and if you can empower people with those tools that's when you start to deliver true transformation to your customers and it really becomes about your purpose and i know purpose is one of those difficult things on one level it's this sort of trite marketing slogan about who you are but for me you know at my heart but purpose is about not what you do but it's about what you enable your customers to achieve as a result of you being you if you follow me and if you think about your business in that that lens and you empower your people to work against that purpose that's when the magic happens. If I could give you an example. So um, I'm lucky enough to be involved with a, a, a large uh, pub and restaurant uh, business in the UK. And one of the things I love about the chairman of this business is when I was talking to him about purpose, he was saying, look, Dave, you know, I've been working in pubs and restaurants my entire life. But the thing that you really got to understand is I'm, I'm not in the pub or restaurant business. I'm in the entertainment business because if you come to one of our places, one of our outlets and you don't have a great time, then we've kind of failed in, in our opportunity. So yes, the product is, you know, a beer or food or whatever it may be, but the reality is it's the experience that matters. It's the outcome that we enable for our customers. And I love that because if you can equip every employee with that sense is, yes, of course, you've got to give great service. And yes, of course, the food has to be good and the drinks have to be right and all that sort of stuff. But it's this concept of the purpose is to provide a great experience for the guest. That sense that gives the people a North Star and it empowers them wherever they are in the organization, however they're working, whatever they're doing, to think, based on what I'm about to do, how's that going to drive the guest's experience? How's that going to drive our purpose as an organization? So part of your challenge in engaging employees when they're not working with you is that sense of purpose. How are you going to equip them with a sense of purpose that, gi that gives them the, the, sort of the guidelines, the framework from which they can do their best work? And it is about empowerment. It is, you can't do this yourselves. The only way you can do this is if you unleash the potential of all of your people. And if you empower them with that purpose and you say, look, this is what we want to do. This is how we want to operate. These are the things that we want to help our customers achieve. And then you stand back, you stand back and you let your people deliver against that. That's where the magic starts to happen. But in order to get there, we have to wean ourselves off this process addiction that we have where you know we're so fixated i'm measured on the process of work rather than the outcome of work and it kind of reminds me and this is not what you think it is uh, of a story of, of the beginning of my career when i was working for apple and um uh, in fact i was working for apple is irrelevant i was just in london and it was early in the morning and i'm walking down the street i'm walking down oxford street in london if you know oxford street in london you know it's a busy street even at 6 a.m and as i'm walking down the street i come across this guy he's a council worker and he's got high vision his jacket and he's walking down the middle of the road and he's putting these little dollops of white powder um in in the middle of the road and it's really weird there's taxis and buses swerving around him and you know i'm a curious guy i've got time on my side so i go up to him i say hey, listen um what, what are you doing he says i'm pointing down elephant powder I'm like, elephant powder what's that for he just looks at me and smiles and goes keeps the elephants away and i'm like but there aren't any elephants in london and he just looks at me and goes oh no it's good stuff isn't it i'm here all week the point is, and that's a lovely joke that was repurposed by a great sort of, uh, leader in the HR industry called David D'Souza. Um, 
the point of the story is we are trapped in a world of process, doing things that are completely irrelevant and redundant in a modern digital society, and especially in a modern digital society in a post-pandemic world. Our challenge is to rid the world of this elephant powder, because this is the stuff that stops us from changing. This is the stuff that stops us from transforming. It prevents change. Our job is to walk around the organisation and really question, why do we do things the way that we do them today? And quite often you'll find this answer, and it's always a beautiful answer, which is, do you know, I, I don't know why we do it like this, but we've always done it like this. That's when you know you've found elephant powder. But this is part of the challenge. This flip from process to outcomes-based sort of measurement is fundamental to your success, not just in the coming weeks and months, but in the coming years. We have to flip the way that we think about measuring the progress of our organisation in the number of boxes packed, the number of letters filed, and instead the outcomes that those things enable. And this is where trust comes in. And this is challenging. And, you know, especially when we think in terms of flexible and remote working, trust is always an issue. And we did a lot of research for this uh, as part of writing the first book. And we found this really beautiful insight, which was, you know, we would expect that the issue of trust for most people when it comes to remote working is about the boss versus the employee, right? And, and I've had this experience both personally and, and also with clients, you know, where it's like, if I can't see Dave, how do I know he's working? And that's what we thought the issue would be. It's basically, you know, uh, Dave's not at work again. Yeah, well, well, now his patio's getting on, that sort of stuff. But actually, that wasn't the biggest problem when it came to trust. The biggest problem when it came to trust with flexible working was actually the lack of parity about different employees. So if I'm working in a team, right, and as an, um, you know, one individual in that team, I choose to work flexibly and everybody else is coming into the office. Over a while, two, over, over, over time, two things start to happen. Number one, everybody in the organization is like, well, why is Dave not here? What's he doing? You know, I wonder how his patio is getting on. That's one side of the conversation. But then the second side is actually me, the remote worker. I start to get paranoid. I start to worry about how do I prove to the people that I'm working? So I'm starting to get up at six o'clock. I'm sending 15 emails before 7.30. Bang, bang, bang. Look at me still here. I might not be in the office, but terrible. Absolutely terrible. And the challenge is we have to make the opportunity to work remotely to work flexibly equal to everybody one of the most interesting things that's happened over the last few weeks for all of the horror and all of the terrible things that have happened over the last few weeks is we have made flexible working uh, the same for everybody everybody has to do it and as a result we're not having those trust issues. We're just cracking on. We're just getting on with the job. Our challenge going forward is how do we maintain that sense of parity? How do we make sure that we empower people with the trust to know that just because I physically can't see them and maybe just because I'm not seeing evidence of their work at a specific moment in the day, that doesn't mean they're not working. It just means that they're working in a flexible way. If we can crack that, then we can build what a friend of mine calls intelligent organisms. And organisms under unlike organizations, are malleable. They bend, they react to changes in the environment. This is what we're going to need. And again, not just in the weeks and months ahead, but in the years ahead, organizations that can react to changes, you know, almost on an organic level so that they're able to respond effectively. We're not waiting for a letter from the boss or from head office to tell us that we can do it. We've been empowered by a purpose. We know what we're, what, what's accessible to us and so we can go off and make it happen. But in order to do that, we ourselves, as individuals, this isn't just about getting management in the right place or getting the culture in the right place. It's about us. We have a responsibility as individuals. And part of this is our challenge about our relationship with technology. And whilst this video playing behind me is hilarious, it's actually a real video. It's a public safety video from South Africa. At South Africa. And it's a video that I use a lot because to me, it talks about how far our relationship with technology has, has gone and gone wrong. We have become slaves to the machine. And this is not not where we're supposed to be. And, and this isn't just about looking at our phones. It's about being busy, being busy. One of the curses of, of flexible working or of mobile working, having the technology, having access to our business, wherever we are, is that we quite enjoy getting stuck in. And the problem is, for the most part, what we're doing is actually we're just 
being busy, being busy. We're not product, productive in the sense of creating something. We're moving information from A to B and B to A. Part of your challenge, and I get that this is really difficult, is to start to be really mindful about what are the things that I have to get done today? What are the, are the, the things that I have to be able to create? How am I going to move things forward? And some of that will be the noise and chatter of email and online meetings and all that sort of stuff. But I know that many of you are finding it really difficult when it comes to being able to segregate the sort of the, the work that you have to do from actually being not at work. And that gets even harder when we're in a scenario where work isn't 20 miles away and a painful commute away. It's actually just down the corridor in the spare room. But what we need you to do is to start thinking about, well, how am I going to sort of be more productive, but productive in its truest sense, not more process, but more output. And that's where you do this tricky thing with productivity, because to be truly productive is actually about doing less in more time. And I get that that's counterintuitive, but it's about how do we sort of un unleash the potential of your contribution to the organization, all that creativity, all that beautiful experience that you have that's being hidden because you're too busy doing emails or sitting on virtual meetings or whatever it may be. Actually, that's stuff that can really add value. And you can use the technology to help, right? The technology is here to help you. And, and we used to have this concept called the nine to five. And, and for lots of people, not for everybody, but for lots of people, the nine to five is again an old Victorian principle that is irrelevant in our modern society. The technology that many of you, and certainly the technology you're using right now to engage with this event, enables you to work at any time of day, any time that is suitable to you. And I want you, we talked earlier on about flexible working and the reason reality about flexible working is flexible working is in part about the location of work but it's also about the time of work and if we can get the culture of our organization if you can empower your employees to think about flexible working in the context of based on what I have to do today what is the where is the most appropriate location and what would be the best time for me to do it? Think about the situation. I don't know this won't be forever. The situation you're in today, if you're like me, some of you will have kids at home or, you know, homeschooling or, or doing their online lessons. You know, we've all have got, I've got family responsibilities. I've got lots of work that I want to do, things that I want to do, all that sort of stuff. I should be empowered by my organization to say, well, actually, um, you know, my son finishes his lessons at one o'clock. I'm going to sit and have lunch at one. Uh, actually, there's some other stuff that I need to do. And then I'll maybe do my work in the evening. There's no problem in that. Unless I've got a client deadline or anything, being empowered to be able to use the technology to work in a way that's appropriate for me at a location and time that's appropriate me for, for me. That's the point of this stuff. That's why we have this technology around us. And so we just got to make it happen. But I want to leave you with our biggest challenge and our biggest challenge in all of this uh, is our own behavior and, and how difficult it is sometimes uh, to change that. And the best example I could give you of how difficult it is to change behavior is something that you use every single day. Uh, some of you may even be using it right now and you'll find it underneath your fingertips. And it is, in fact, this beautiful thing. It's the it's the QWERTY keyboard layout. And I don't know if you know about the story behind the origin of the QWERTY keyboard layout. Does anybody know how old uh, this design is? Uh, you, yeah, you, you at the back. Uh, yeah, nearly. It's, it's 150 years old. That's how old this design is. And what I love about why it was created, and there's a bit of controversy about this, but one of the sort of creation stories about the QWERTY keyboard is in a world of mechanical typewriters, if the typists got too good, too good at their job, too quick, then what would happen is as they were typing, of course, the mechanical heads on the keyboard would jam. And that typist would lose productivity until the machine was fixed that they could resume what they were doing. So along comes Mr. QWERTY, not his real name, uh, who invents the QWERTY keyboard layout, whose primary design principle is to slow people down. It's designed to ensure that the typist cannot exceed a certain threshold of speed and therefore will never jam the machine and therefore will maximize the productivity of the individual 150 years ago. Fantastic technology, <laughs> 150 years ago. So we are today still using a design that not only is 150 years old, its entire principle, its entire reason for existing is to be suboptimal.
right? This is how much we suck at change, right? So because 80 years ago, along comes a bloke called Mr. Dvorak, and that was his real name, um, who invents the Dvorak keyboard layout, which is, unlike QWERTY, is designed for speed. It's built to be pushed as fast as a human being could possibly type. Its operational efficiency is up at about 70% compared to 30 with QWERTY. You could type uh, 100 of the English language's most common words without ever leaving the home row of letters, right? It's just brilliant, right? So he designed that 80 years ago. And look at us. We're still using this design. This is the challenge for us. This is what, and I get there are complexities about standards and all that sort of stuff, but the principle is the same. We suck at change. We've got to think about things differently. And I want you to think in the months ahead and the years ahead, based on the lessons that we've all learned about how technology empowers us to do amazing things, to be productive at a time when actually we may not have been productive before. How are we going to carry the best bits of that forward? And I'm not saying that we're never going into the office or that we're no, never going to work in this way again all i'm saying is that actually this is about a blend of those two worlds in the past where maybe we might have had working remotely as the exception to the rule maybe we flip it around maybe working flexibly is the rule and we go into the office as the exception you need to find a balance that will fit you and your organization fits your culture but your challenge is about how you build that culture and this for me is all about the rise of the humans because the rise of the humans is about how we unleash human potential it's about how do we equip our organization our people with the culture with with the the, the purpose of what we want to do to be able to harness the power of technology to make not just what they do at work better but their lives better if we can make sure that every member of the team every member of the organization, every member of our family, every member of society has access to these skills that light the value of technology up, then and only then can we as humans rise up and live up to all of the opportunity that an engaged employee can have working flexibly, working remotely to do amazing things. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for spending it with me. I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Wow, thanks, Dave. That was fantastic. Um, uh, I know from my side, I'm not sure uh, what the highlights were, uh, how I could kind of condense them, but I do have to choose three because I only ever do things in threes. I think for me, uh, one of the highlights was around giving people having purpose and a very clear direction as far as where, uh, as an organization, you want them to go. That would certainly be one. Uh, I think the importance of empowerment and how that increases engagement going forward, I think that's got to be critical to uh, to the success. And I think uh, I was uh, chuckling away when you talked about the, the curse of being busy, where people are, uh, are uh, engrossed in being engaged in something as opposed to uh, it being real or appropriate work. So... So fantastic. So I'm really excited now. I'm sure we've got a whole bunch of, uh, I can see we've got a whole bunch of um, questions to answer. So we're going to disappear from people's screens, which may be uh, cause a ripple of excitement out there. And uh, we're going to switch to audio. Thanks, Dave. Talk shortly. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me.